You're listening to WMPG 90.9 Core in Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me as always is Bernie Ryan, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab here at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And you can head over to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, certainly. So this will be Friday, February 11th. So we're going to have a waxing gibbous moon um, because on the 8th it was first quarter and it won't be full till the 16th. So that's those seven days between first quarter and full moon. Um, the days are getting longer. Um, sun now rises at 6.46 in the morning and doesn't set till 5.04. So that's pretty good. Uh, we're actually just past halfway through winter already. Groundhog Day was back on February 2nd. Um, that marks, it's called a cross-quarter day, which are really important. There's really eight of those total. I mean, there's four seasons and four cross-quarter days. So we're halfway through winter, just beyond that. And then basically, uh, you'll still see Jupiter. It's just about setting a little bit after sunset. And then the other planets are basically up in the morning, Mars and Venus, and Saturn are all morning planets right now. Excellent. So that's basically it for the planets, but um, I'll give you an update on the James Webb because we're doing this earlier before the 11th, but it had reached um, its point where it's going, the L2 point about a million miles away. It reached it exactly when it was supposed to, a month after it was launched on Christmas Day. So it reached it back in January 25th. So now the long process is starting of getting all the mirrors perfect. It has 18 mirror segments. So combined, they make a 21 foot mirror, which is huge. And they can be uh, finely tuned. And that's what they're starting to do. And they may actually have more fuel than they thought because they got there so efficiently. Now they think it may last easily more than the 10 years that they were hoping so, hoping for. So that'll be great. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's yeah. it's successful, I would say, so far, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, and nothing. I mean, it got through nothing. all those. It had 355 points of possible failure. Any one of them could have destroyed the 10 billion dollars. Yeah. that it cost. I mean, you may think that's a lot of money, but I watched people that it was really, it's only about a dollar a year for each taxpayer over the amount of time it took to make it and that amount of time is going to be there. So that mm-hmm. total is like 35 years. So it's only a dollar a year per person. So one less than now one cup of coffee, that's all across <laughs> the taxpayer. So when you when you break down the 10 billion, that, you know, it, it's really going to be well worth it. Plus mm-hmm. all the data is going to be available at first. And then the data from the people, you know, obviously they're all scheduling. They got their schedule. They're not going to let us know who's going to get it first. But um, and then the scientists will do their analysis and then it'll be open to everybody because it is our taxpayers telescope. So that's a really yeah. neat way to look at it. Yep. Could you say that we own a piece of it? Yeah. Yeah, we do actually. Yeah. yeah. So less than that one cup of coffee per year. That's all we're paying and we get to own a piece of it. I mean. You don't get a good investment like that in anything else I can think of. <laughs> yeah. Could there be a super interesting fact um, mm. when you're playing icebreakers or not? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Bernie. Oh, sure. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. So time is the kind of presence of motion and forces time isn't a dimension it's slower where there's expansion of space um and absolute time is meaningless and doesn't really exist and your your time is different from my time is different from bernie's time and depending on how fast we are moving um time can be perceived differently by different people newton saw time as absolute and true and that it flows without regard to anything else, um, that it's external to it. But as we have had many people, and you know, even us personally, we've always questioned what exactly is time. And that's how we're going to start off today's segment, is 
just on the idea of time and some of the ideas that some of our physicists of our modern time have, <laughs> of our modern time, um, first kind of have about what time is and how to answer that question. So Bernie, mm -hmm. why don't you kick us off with, I know you wanted to talk about um, Dr. Ian Durham. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we've had him on the show before. Um, he's actually writing his own book about the nature of time. So I haven't gotten a lot of details about how he's doing on that. Of course, that's a long process. The book we're going to discuss later today, it took many years, of course, to write. But um, so um, you, you've, well, even if you hadn't heard him, he does a lot of work with um, the Foundational Questions Institute. Um, he often at the end will do several interviews about the top 10 science stories. And he's met all these people. Obviously, he knows Julian Barber, we're going to talk about later. He knows Sean Carroll. Lee Smolin, a lot of these other physicists that are, are working on the, on these big concepts. So, um, yeah, so he, uh, Ian, well, a few years ago, he went to a whole conference for three weeks. I think it was up in the North Atlantic on, on, a, on a boat or something, and it wasn't even that smooth. So I think some of the physicists weren't too happy up there. Um, so they all did some presentations, and, of course, after three weeks, no one actually agreed on what time really is. They all learned more details about it, but no one could agree on what it is or... You know, you know, just so people could share the ideas. So it's, it's you no, know, there's no set answer, obviously, but it was very interesting how involved. And it's so basic, really, to everything we know and can do. And it's something we're going to probably be working on for like millions of more years, the real nature of time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so you mentioned the um, Dr. Julian Barber, mm -hmm. which is kind of who is the focus of our show today, um, who talks about time and a couple of other concepts related to that, um, some of his ideas about it. So Dr. Julian Barber is actually quite a renowned physicist. Um, I didn't know about him until Bernie had mentioned him, but as always, Bernie introduces a lot of um, yeah. people and things to me. But he's a British physicist who was born in 1937 and um, alma mater, University of Cambridge and University of Cologne. And he did his PhD on the foundations of Albert Einstein's general theory theory of relativity. And he is actually the author of four books, two of which we will kind of go over today. Um, the first one was in 1999, he wrote The End of Time. In 2001, he wrote The Discovery of Dynamics. In 2006, Absolute or Relative Motion. And his latest book, The Janus Point, A New Theory of Time. So he is obsessed with time and coming up with different ways of understanding it. Um, so I don't know how his views of time have changed since his first book, but um, Bernie, what is what do you think he, uh, if you could kind of boil down his, mm -hmm. his ideas of time and how that differs from maybe our modern understanding of what time is? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, his latest book, The Janus Point, um, that has a whole new insight of how time might work. Mm -hmm. So, but Julian, I mean, based on the only other book I read was The End of Time. So basically, he, think, uh, he thinks time is an illusion. Um, and he shows kind of how that works because time, what really counts is um, in relation to events and people and things and even clocks because there's no absolute time. I mean, Isaac Newton obviously thought there was. And um, Einstein, of course, showed there wasn't because it was the space-time continuum. So there's no absolute time. But as far as it being an illusion, a lot of other physicists don't necessarily agree with that per se, even though they probably agree there's no absolute time because obviously if you move faster, time will move slower for you and all these things we've discussed before. Sure. So, yeah. So that's one of his points. Um, so he, he thinks that time is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And... Um, what about that? So he, he talks about kind of the interaction of events as being our way of understanding time. I think, um, uh, you know, something in astronomy that I think people like to say is you you view the sky against this or you view objects in the night sky against this background of stars mm -hmm. and the 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 only way that you recognize that an object is moving is by comparing it to that background of stars. And I almost wonder if um, if what he's talking about is is kind of like that, because 
um, Feynman, I think his, his ideas about time were on kind of time is what is there if everything else is taken out, right? But yeah. it almost seems like Barber's idea is kind of opposite of that. Yeah. Would that be the well, right interpretation? Well, it's like the different. Everything is just, it's like a snapshot, a series of events. If any, if things didn't change, there would be no time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, it's just the fact that things change. I mean, you can compare it to a movie. The whole movie's already there. A, a novel, a book, anything you write. So, things change. I mean, there's whole methods about writing and techniques, how to make all this interesting, the narrative arc, all the different things you need to do. So, that's how life kind of goes. And that's the only thing that gives you a sense of a time, you know, a before and an after. He thinks, of course, then there's really, really no past yeah. and really no future either. It's yeah. just a change that makes you think like you're just putting a whole bunch of snapshots together. And there's obviously a difference. And yeah. that kind of defines the time. It's not that's not like against the background of stars was a really good example. So that's kind of how. Right. So does he believe that like the there's no past, there is no future, there is only. Mm -hmm. A presence or how does how does he define all of those concepts are those yeah. real to him right well it's the it's the relation between the events i mean um he doesn't really get into the philosophy of it i mean i can give you some of my philosophy or what, what i think the present is and so on and why it's so important mm -hmm. um basically i agree with the part of not being a past or future because even we've talked about neuroscientists and all kinds of people they're saying that you're really recreating the past in your mind mm. at the present moment. And memories are so fallible and they could be changed. They do that all the time in court mm -hmm. cases and so on. So in a sense, that's kind of what Julian Barber says, um, that it's kind of in your mind. Um, and then, of course, the present is really the only moment, but we don't really know what the present is because it's probably not even in this dimension. So hmm. I feel like my mind is struggling <laughs> but mm -hmm. okay so if is it is it correct if i say he believes that there's no such thing as a past i mean the brain kind of creates everything and okay. a lot of neuroscientists say that and he doesn't know of course the nature of consciousness there's all kinds of mathematical sure. models on dr ian durham is working on one doing a huge project on that a lot of physicists have done that so that's all eventually it's all going to relate to that but I really need thing I agree with Julian Barber, the brain creates all this. There's no past or future. And it's all the interaction of the things. I mean, we know things are just a collection yeah, of atoms yeah. and forces. So it's not really even a thing. It's really an event. He doesn't get to that level of it. But yeah. So then mm -hmm. if if I see that, you know, one second ago, mm -hmm. a cup was on the table and my mm -hmm. cat was on the table <laughs> and... Mm -hmm one second from now the cup is now on the floor and my cat is still on the table like mm -hmm. there's evidence that there was a past mm -hmm. but i yeah. guess how does that fit into his <laughs> idea well, of time well, i'm like a little i mean obviously there's differences and there's series of events but i don't know exactly how he relates into that thinking that there's really I no past see. I mean, other than the fact that the brain is constructing everything, it's constructing our whole world, uh -huh. that whole illusion. And, and the time is needed just to kind of be in sync, even though Einstein has shown that everyone's time is actually different. The whole world, word of relativity, you could also think of it as personal, personal time or relative time. Yeah, so That's a yeah. whole other way. Everyone does have a personal time, other than the fact if you're doing something fun, time flies. And if you listen to a boring lecture or reading a boring book, time goes slow. Mm -hmm. Other than even that part of it, it does actually move differently from every viewpoint, every frame of reference, mm -hmm. which is a physical principle other than your own emotional thinking of you if you're happy with what you're doing or if you're not. Mm -hmm. So everything kind of is created in the brain and is just that relation. Even space, space kind of being the other side of time, the space-time continuum is really important here. That kind of works the same way too. There's really no space. It's just separating events. And that's what, that's what time does. So then if you put all the events together in a quote unquote timeline, mm -hmm. that does not in any way represent some kind of visual of time by his definition. It's just a story. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, actually, that's a good point. It's uh, he 
the first chapter in his book says that the universe is not about things, but it's about stories. It, it's oh. a little quote, it's not his whole chapter. So yeah, yeah, so time is a story. It's almost like a story we tell ourselves. That, that That's all the time is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then how do you, how do others in kind of physics and astronomy, um, do you know about some of their criticisms of his? his yeah. Ideas? So Sean Carroll says that um, he doesn't really agree with Julian and he wouldn't, you know, like read this whole, I don't know, 400 page book because he doesn't. Uh, Sean doesn't think Julian gives enough evidence of his view that time is an illusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, Sean believes in relativity and so on. But um, all physicists aren't always going to agree and think that's great. I mean, the whole process of science is changing, um, showing new evidence, changing, right. being able to evolve. You know, probably even atoms evolve as far as that goes. So all that's part of it. And that's good. You wouldn't want everyone to agree. and They could all be wrong yeah. <laughs> if they all agree. Yeah. So what, how do you see time then, Bernie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I agree with a lot of aspects of a lot of different people. Um, now, there's one thing called the block universe, which I kind of like. Um, I think Julian actually probably doesn't believe in that per se, because it takes the space-time four dimension that we're all kind of in. And so you're, a timeline of an event or a thing or a person's life could all be tracked in this fourth dimension, you know, when they were born, when they die. Um, and everything could be tracked away because everything's already there. The past, the present, and the future, they're all kind of there. So I think that's kind of one way to see a little bit of the larger picture of it. Um, I've actually talked to, I mean, this is a little bit beyond just the science, but I've talked to people, they were probably psychics. I, I, probably everyone has heard of past life regressions. You know, if they believe in past lives, you can regress and know who you were in, in the past and so on. But this same person also does future life progressions. And that gets really interesting, and that would only be possible, I would think, if there is this block universe. So this person had then, you know, had met some aliens, you know, a couple hundred years from now, and this was all just as real at that moment as anything else that the brain can make up in the past, present, and future, because it's all already there. The future is a different version of the past, and they're both kind of illusions if you can rise to the next dimension that we're in, and they can both kind of be illusions. But um, yes, so the block universe, maybe only half the scientists agree with it, but that's yeah, kind yeah. of a way to kind of see all of that at once. I mean, one funny thing about time, it's just a way to prevent everything from happening at once. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's simple. I mean, everything kind of is happening at once, but, you know, yeah. we can't grasp because we're on that, that one little point. So that's another way to look at time. But the block universe, everything does happen at once and it can kind of be seen that way. Right. I mean, it's it's I've never actually sat down and had you know some kind of educated academic um discussion about what i think time is mostly because i don't think it's like does it change anything in my life if if it was kind of defined differently but as i'm listening to you know how you are describing barber's point mm -hmm. um it really isn't that important that there is a past mm -hmm. i mean it was important that that all happened because like you say mm -hmm. not everything can happen at once like not everything should happen at once and can because mm -hmm. there needs to be build up to xyz there needs to be build up to us being at this point having this conversation right now yeah like even it actually relates right to the very beginning of the universe itself yeah. I mean, the fact that you can drop the arrow of time, you can drop a wine glass off the table and it'll break and it'll never reassemble, that can be traced to the very beginning of the universe. It's really yeah. fascinating stuff, too. And us talking now and our listeners listening and all these type of things. Now, right. I'm putting a lot of my own interpretations into Barber. People shouldn't just think it's Julian Barber, but I'm interpreting things and in what yeah, I think. Yeah, about yeah, too. yeah, for sure. I don't know exactly what he thinks. <laughs> um, and then I think something else that's um, that's... Mm -hmm interesting coming out of him is is the measurement of time mm -hmm. and um i think you know in our daily lives as long as we have a relative sense of time or as you say a personal sense of time mm -hmm. um that is at least somewhat in line with each other we can make yeah. things work and yeah. do things and create things um but measuring time is is this whole other thing that i mm -hmm. mean there have been 
hundreds of people, thousands of people dedicating their lives to this. Um, But something you learned from Barbara Mm -hmm. was that there's more than our 10 atomic clocks. Yeah. Yeah, I was always fascinated with time and atomic clocks are always getting better. Now they can be accurate within a billions of, they wouldn't even lose a billions of a second per year. So in other words, in one year, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a billion, it would take a billion years to lose one second. And now they're getting (laughs) some that are even more accurate. So basically what they're measuring now, they're based on the transition rates of certain atoms, like they use cesium and they use rubidium, and now they have clocks that are even more accurate and even more like quantum computers and stuff. But so Julian Barber was saying, it's still, you still need a way to read it and have it make some sense to right, the atom right. itself. I mean, you could kind of see that every atom, uh, you know, the time of the year being the Earth going around the sun, that is all has time built into it already. Yeah. So it kind of does. So that's why you can take the transition. rate. It happened to be 9.39 billion vibrations per second in the cesium atom. So that's how it defines an atomic cesium clock. And of course, as you said, people spend their whole career just getting a more accurate clock. So it is important. It's important for more than just GPS. It's important for finances and just learning more about, you know, nature and how things really work. But the neat thing is that there's like 10 really good atomic clocks that are kind of competing and they're getting to a billionth or less per second per year accuracy. But what I didn't know and what Julian Barber said, there's 400 other atomic clocks that are needed to back this up to have those 10 clocks mean something because they're measuring all kinds of other things, including how other planets move, the shape of the Earth, continental drift, all these, I mean, even the tides, everything relates to what the the real meaning of that actual second is. So it kind of shows everything's connected. So the further out and the more accurate we get, uh, the more we'll see these connections and we can get them to this super accurate level of basically a nanosecond, that's a billionth of a second. And then probably we'll probably get to a picosecond in maybe five or ten more years, a yeah, trillionth of a second. So it's related and it's important because, as Relativity says, and we might have covered this, it was actually one of the top ten science stories, they now measured a different flow in time in a difference of less than one millimeter away, you know, further up in space, away from the center of the Earth. Time flows slower the closer you get to the source of gravity, like near a black hole. And it, now they measured it at less than one millimeter. I always tell my students, time will flow um, slower on the first floor of this building, I'm in a three-story building, than from the roof. And now they can measure it at less than one millimeter based on these atomic clocks. So that shows how that works and how relativity works. And that we each have our own different flow of time, of course. Time will flow different at, from your head than from your feet. So that's another neat way to look at it, too. Right, right. Yeah. Now, we're so not being stretched. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say, your feet grow older than your head. <laughs> yeah. And if you fly in an airplane in you know, the back seat, you will actually age a couple nanoseconds differently than someone that stays on the ground. If you fly around the earth, I mean, they have clocks that can measure that. But now they can measure just even a millimeter difference. Hmm. Okay. Let's move on. Mm-hmm. Um, laws of thermodynamics. This also has to do with time. And you had mentioned um, the Janus Point is the latest mm-hmm. book of um, Julian Barber. All this right. was like a really huge insight he had. He worked on for many years after he wrote the End of Time book. So basically, the new insight, which is the name of the book, he wanted to call it something different. I think at first, if if I don't know if you know what Janus is, he was a Roman god of um, gateways and time and yep. changes. And the, the word January is named for that. So every time I write my January column, I, I refer to Janus. Nice, so it's nice. a God looking in both directions at once. So the huge insight that Julian Barber had, and this restores the symmetry of the universe, is that it didn't just blow out in the one direction from the Big Bang. It also blew out in, an, in the other direction. So the arrow of time is still the same for people in that other universe. They yeah, think yeah. it's always moving forward. And we think it's always moving forward because, as you know, it, it, you know, a rock will never jump out of a pond. However, the symmetry is restored because they're moving forward from this point, which could be the Big Bang, or if, if it's in a multiverse, it could be anywhere else, or it could be going on all the time. So that restores all the symmetry, and that was his big big breakthrough. We're only seeing half of that, and that's the zero point. I mean, other people call it all kinds of different things, but it restores the symmetry. So that's yeah, really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what... Um... So he he talks also about the universe moving towards complexity. What is that Mm -hmm. about? 
Right. Well, normally, of course, based on laws of thermodynamics, the universe would eventually run down. Every time you do anything, any mechanical thing, some of that energy is lost in heat and it's not going to reconstruct itself. Mm -hmm. So the universe is, well, there's two options. It's like fire or ice. So it'll go out in ice. It'll lose all the atoms, will eventually lose all the forces, and you won't have any more stars or galaxies or atoms or planets or anything forming. Fortunately, that won't be for about a Google years. That's the real number. It's 10 to the 100. Yep. It's not just a search engine, and it's spelled differently. And it's pretty accurate. It'll be about a Google year. The last black hole will evaporate, which Stephen Hawking said, and then everything will go out, especially because we're expanding at an ever-increasing rate. The whole universe won't come back together. Of course, it doesn't really matter because we're in a multiverse and then all this can happen again, called the eternal inflation theory and so on. But um, yeah, so that will go out. So however, people and plants and animals and even stars are much more organized form than just the Big Bang when everything was just a hot plasma. Mm -hmm. So everything doesn't necessarily always just run down because entropy and those laws, you know, they're based on Boltzmann's laws and all that, that's based on a closed system. Now, the universe may not be a closed system. So it's literally not, you know, always heard the term out of the box thinking, but Julian Barber is super out of the box. He's out of the whole universe thinking. <laughs> and then he can see that complexity actually involves and increases. He doesn't say the laws of entropy are wrong because they're, they're obviously not right. They're perfectly fine in a closed system. But if the universe is in a closed system, then complexity can increasingly evolve all the time forever. Yeah. And that's yeah. a huge breakthrough. Maybe some scientists believe that and some don't. But this obviously I agree with some of those things. Yeah. Interesting. Actually, even an atom can yeah. be thought of as a closed system. The part, an atom experiences time, obviously, because it keeps the time for us. Yeah. But the quarks that make up the protons and neutrons and the electrons, because they, they don't experience time. Because and if they can move forward or backward. They don't really know. And, of course, the photon is always at the speed of light. So the photon experiences no time whatsoever, ever. The right. photon can never experience time. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point, too, at that subatomic level. Right. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. a photon never really dies. Well, right. No, it doesn't. Right. I mean, and it has a dual nature. It'll travel between things as a wave, but it also has energy when it interacts. That's when you can take it and measure it. So then you get into all the different interpretation of quantum mechanics, the wave function collapse, the parallel universe, the multi multi world theory, the pilot wave theory. And this is really interesting. And that's how anything can come about. You know, the tree falling in the forest and all this, if there was no one there to see it. Well, it's energy, but it's how you interpret that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this conversation has made mm -hmm. me wonder, am I mm -hmm. actually alive? Yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, I'm seriously doubting that. Like, yeah. what is this right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we are. I mean, that, that's an interesting thing that Dr. Ian Durham, who is also in my astronomy club, he says, mm -hmm. um, actually, he would not be able to prove if he weren't really a goat herder in Mongolia someplace right now. Mm -hmm. And probably Julian Barber would, would agree because if this is all created in our mind with our brains, which are obviously very brilliant to be able to do this, right. then he could be that too. And you can be several places at once. We've done that with atoms. We've even done it with molecules. So when we haven't done it with people, but you can certainly think of all these different things at once. You can travel way faster than light in that sense. And if and Ian is really scientific and he doesn't believe in the speed of thought or anything like that, but he says there's no way he could prove that he's not a goat herder in Mongolia right this very second while he's in our astronomy club reviewing the top 10 science stories. And that's, that's certainly true for any one of us. Yeah. So what would you want our listeners to think about as we close their show? Yeah, well, just to kind of the more out of the box type thinking. I mean, it doesn't mean, you know, unless you do this professionally like Julian Barber, that you're going to have ideas like this and be able to write a 400 page book and have, I don't know, <laughs> millions of people read it or whatever. But just, I mean, the nature of time is super important for everyone all the time. And the fact that relativity, another way of thinking is as personal, personal time versus relative time. And everyone has it. Everyone has a sense of time. Uh, you could say, for instance, if you were to ask to define time like we're trying to do, um, you can't really define it, but you kind of intrinsically know what it is. Yeah. You know, it's this kind of flow of time, this kind of a change. I don't know just, if I intrinsically know what it is anymore, Bernie. Yeah, I know. I, I gave you so many other different views. Yeah. No, we do, and our own view of it evolves, and that's why it's good to hear other views mm -hmm. and us, and, you know, we review other people and throw some of our own things in, obviously, to see how, and, and everyone has that different sense. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, time's important. Obviously, the more accurately you can measure, the more accurately you can do things. Super accurate time will be important in quantum computers, and they're making huge leaps and advances every day, every week. They're being able to do them, do them at cooler temperatures, getting more qubits entangled. I mean, this is all important to all of us all the time. Yeah. The time again. <laughs> yeah, all the time. We have done that quite a bit. Um, yeah. Surprising how, how much time is a part of our vocabulary um, hmm. and yeah. all of our most common sayings, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So clearly it's a very human um, idea. Mm -hmm. Well... Thank you, Bernie, for that. And again, that was Julian Barber, and his latest book is The Janus Point, A New Theory of Time, released in 2020. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WPG with myself and Bernie. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella and for your favorite nerds. Just a reminder to vaccinate, to mitigate, then we can all congregate.